Do you think Mike would like a cup of coffee? I don't know. Maybe when I ask him. You know what? I'll check in on him. Maybe a little bit later. Okay. Agent Preacher, to what do we owe this pleasure? I'd like to borrow your detective for a moment. Help yourself. My entry says he's still yours anyway. Thank you. I think you know why I'm here. For what it's worth, I appreciate you taking the time. But it's Mooney's decision. Yeah. He's in the interview room. Oh, well, I'll wait till he's free. Oh, he's by himself. All right, then. He buried his sister yesterday morning, sir. Mike did. Just so you should know. You think it's best I should wait? No. You go in there and talk to him, sir. It's a good thing you're coming here. Special Agent. I heard about your loss, Detective. I'm truly sorry. Thanks. Detective Mooney, I'd like you to come back to your desk downtown. Why would I want to do that? The forensic evidence you presented last Friday. Your theories on the tie-in between the death of that doorman and Corelli and the setup of the Russian bouncer. On all of that, I believe you are correct. Which you know how. A protected informant of ours was hired to uh, wash up after the Vicky Tompkins murder. So he's off limits. Is this what you're telling me? Detective, I will do everything in my power to position this CIA so as to be of use to you on the Vicky Tompkins homicide. But right now, he don't help me clear the case. No, but I can. This where you offer me the federal perks, the wiretaps, the microscope on the moon. No. This is where I offer you what I believe. Well, I'm all ears, Special Agent. Paragon Corporation, Howard Klein, Lawrence Stark. They launder money, and now with Vicki Tompkins, they do murder as well. I work the murder, you work the money. Think about it. Please don't consider this presumptuous but I think it's just what you need right now. Good day, Detective. Sir? I'm sure your partner will fill you in on our conversation. Me and Mike? Oh, definitely. And maybe I'll see you both soon. This is New York City. Anything is possible. Coming in here like this today, Special Agent Preacher, shows me something. It's definitely out of his way. If you've accumulated any accessories over the last few days, Vincent, pack them up. We're going back to the bureau. Laser scope, sunglasses, and all. Hosted festival over there. Morning. Oh, good morning, Sarah. We want you to meet uh, U.S. Attorney Deidre Styles. Sarah Day. Pleased to meet you. 
Miss Styles is just finishing the evidence report Jimmy Flynn's prepared on Terry Maddock. I think you should join us for this discussion, Agent. Let's start from the top. This report offers insubstantial grounds to prosecute Terry Maddock. I thought I included a homicide with Terry Maddock's knowledge of forethought. An accomplice after the fact. There's extortion, assault and battery, obstruction of justice. Yes, obstruction of justice. As I read it by this office. And to that extent, any opportunity to prosecute Mr. Maddock for his offenses is jeopardized. That's what the other post-its refer to. We felt the overriding priority was to safeguard our task force operation. Reconciling task force priorities with the federal criminal code is what the weekly conference with the U.S. attorney is supposed to help you with. No question in that area I was somewhat remiss. Let's agree, without denying or minimizing, that uh, some mistakes have been made up until this point. Fine. Then that leaves the question of which agent or agents made them and whether or not they're indictable before we reach the announced topic of how to handle Mr. Maddock. And before we do that, if you'll excuse me, I feel the need to wash my hands. Good morning. Good morning. I feel the need to wash my hands, too. Styles knows she shares responsibility for the dereliction of oversight. Don't discount the possibility that her outrage is tactical. Don't discount the possibility it's personal. Thanks for coming. Hearing I may be indictable tends to get my attention. I know you just transferred in. Do you know what your own exposure is? Do you know how badly he screwed you over on this thing? Who? Jimmy Flynn. I'm not aware he screwed me over at all. I know how he operates Agent Day. The judge authorized full sound and two single lenses for Laughlin's. That means Flynn's probably got enough cameras in there to cover the Super Bowl. I can verify that all the surveillance equipment in that bar squares with the court order. At this point in time? Yes. Meaning he pulled the illegal stuff. Sarah, I respect your loyalty to your colleagues, but you know the saying? You can love the Bureau, but it'll never love you back. If you ever need a primer on the subject, you know where to find me. You think it'll get their attention if we walk in together? Thanks. Where are you gonna pick Maddock up? This would be his day for the track. Styles arrest me, his box is in section C. Counselor, would this be an opportune time for our weekly case conference that we haven't had in four months? Any week you want to talk about. Inconvenience enough, this last minute change of locale for what was supposed to have been a 10 a.m. appointment, but then it kept waiting down in the foyer for nearly an hour. So that's what, 500 bucks to be building this client for waiting? And all for the mere purpose of handing you this, which you continue to refuse to receive. All in good time, Counselor. Howard Klein has compiled a list of Paragon's directors and executives, as well as any friends who have the use of his Park Avenue apartment. Wait a second, we asked Lawrence Stark for this list. Mr. Stark called Mr. Klein? Apparently, yes. A lot of names on this list, Counselor. I've seen motels off the turnpike get less traffic. I'm sure your expertise in turnpike motel traffic is greater than mine. You know, that's funny. I was just gonna say, you remind me of a clerk renting me a room at a Ramada outside of Newark. As it pleases you, detective, I'm merely here in the hopes of procuring for my client a little closure. Closure? You mean closure like in uh, close the door to that apartment or close our eyes to what might have gone down there? I think I've bandied enough words with you this morning, Detective Mooney. You know who could have used a little closure? Vicki Tompkins could use a little closure. If that angel doorman and that Russian patsy, they could use a little closure, too. I'll be leaving now, Detective. So you tell your peripheral personal acquaintance, Mr. Stark, who at this point in time is not your client, that if I find he had a hand in any of this, I'm going to get him all the closure he can handle. Close the door behind you. Who is that? Who is that? That's our poster boy for anger management from the NYPD. Does your poster boy have a name? Mooney. Him and his partner caught the Victoria Tompkins homicide. They've been deputized to us. Can we get out of here, D? Call me Miss Stiles. And you can call me Mr. Tibbs. You should do stand-up, Jimmy. He'd be a lot less dangerous. When you're flying blind, 
Sarah, uh, in uh, heavy cloud cover. The, uh, the only way to ascertain what's truly in front of you is, is radar. What kind of radar did you have in mind for me to use today at my meeting with Bob Cooper? Information. The kind whoever's driving Bob Cooper would be interested in. You tell him Mooney's all excited about a break in the Vicki Tompkins homicide. Someone who might have seen something in the Park Avenue co-op. And then we give him a name. Theo Zachary, let's say. And then we wait. To see if and when that name gets run through the Bureau Indices computer check. I, I think what else Agent Preacher was trying to say is that um, no eye batting would be necessary. Yeah, and you can tell that Rico Suave, all of that is off the table. I think it's Rico Suave. Eh? Yeah, I'm almost positive. That's fine. It's perfect you bringing me here. It's the obvious sentimental ploy. So I hear you saying you think I'm the reliable type. I believe the word is predictable. I'm just trying to find a nice way to remind you that we do have personal history, and I hope you won't let it cloud your professional decision making. So in other words, to prove to you that I don't hold a grudge, you want me to give Terry Maddock a pass for that laundry list of horrors that I read about in your office this morning? No, no. No one is saying a pass. That's exactly what you're saying. Look, let's just be pragmatic about what Terry Maddock can do for us and what we have to give him to get it, without denying or minimizing any past mistakes. Don't we give him the same thing he gives us, Jimmy? A rug to sweep his sins under? Is there self-interest on both sides? Yeah, sure, that's how deals get made. And remember, Dee, you okayed the original deal with Maddock. On my back, in room 401 of that hotel, as I recall. Anyways, what I'm saying, Say no to him now, and the new deal gets shopped to some other U.S. attorney. And what'll sweeten the pot for them will be hanging your beautiful ass out to dry. I don't want to see that happen. Bring Matt again. Get him representation and have him draw up a proffer. But you better have something real on the table this time, Jimmy. He was your childhood idol, not mine. Quiet time, Jamie. Now get the hell away from me. No good, Terry. What the hell do you want? They're bringing you in. You and me both. Who? The Bureau. Well, maybe you haven't noticed, but the Bureau brought you in a long time ago. You work for them. Agent James Flynn. Me? I come and go as I please. Revised arrangement, Terry. Either they lock you up for murder, or you make a deal on their terms. Now, what murder would that be? Did you hang anyone up in your meat locker, Terry? Yeah. Bossy the cow. They say you put a man on a hook. They got it on film. <laughs> Is that what they say? What do you say when they say that? What do you tell them you know? Don't think they won't burn me down, too? Are they ready for their building to burn down, too? With every stinking rat left inside running around in circles? With their... Skeevy little whiskers and tails on fire? This ain't nickel poker, Jimmy. This is a table stakes game, and I've been playing for a long time. You run along back to your boys and ask them do they think I'm bluffing, or do I just go public with everything I know and watch that building burn down and howl like a dog at the moon? Oh! I'm gonna go bet this race. Then I'm going to enjoy my quiet time Thursday at the track.
know what the 48 Monday carried. The boy had a double handful. Orm says he worked the 50. <laughs> That's because I called the time in. Whatever you say, Bricktop. You don't have to put a penny on it for me. Not necessary to put a nickel on it. Very generous of you. I'll be over at the hot dog stand. One horse, thousand dollars, win in place. Smart money likes the four horse. <laughs> Smart money missed his bus today. Ten time is over, Terry. You can listen, we can come to an understanding, or I take you out of here and brace it. Who's gonna put them on me? I got people here who'll do that. You got a lot of people? Come on, Terry. You think you're tougher than my job? You're not. Listen, I just put a bet on a horse. Now I'm gonna go outside and see how he does. I let you do that. What are you gonna do after? What I'm doing is causing me some misgivings. How can I allay those? Well, by reassuring me that reporting to you isn't being disloyal to my immediate superior. You don't think of it as reporting. Think of it as far-reaching, casual conversation on topics of mutual professional interest. Seems they caught a break. The NYPD detectives working the Vicki Tompkins homicide? Do tell. Someone from the building where the murder took place has come forward, and evidently it's a possible eyewitness. Oh, yes? If Detectives Mooney and Trout get a good interview, I heard they're heading straight for the grand jury. Do you have a name for me, sir? Of the person they suspect? Sure. Start there. I don't know who they suspect. Then give me the name of the witness. Yes, sir. Sorry. Did that sound law-giving? <laughs> Theo Zachary. Does that work for you? Mm -hmm, it does. If this wasn't a public place, I'd show you just how much. See? Now, this is a problem. What is? This attraction between us, the way I'm starting to feel. There, I said it. It's out. I had a hunch that this was a two-way street. Yeah. And as tempting as it is to explore these feelings, Bob, I've heard you're a married man. Uh, who told you that? It's in your personnel record. So, if we're to continue having these wide-ranging casual conversations on work-related subjects, we have to take this other thing off the table. But it makes such a pretty centerpiece. Yeah. Take my hand. Let's just pretend that this thing we feel is, is right next to us, and we'll just push it in, into the water. Let's hold hands here for the last time, and then we'll just, just push it in. There it goes, Bob. See it? It's sinking. Just making bubbles now. I'd like to think it would stay put, Sarah. Like other sunken treasure, one day it may again rise to the surface. Perhaps, Bob, but let's not count on it. this last respect, Terry. It's no favor if you don't understand. These guys are ready to take you any way I want you brought in. And believe me, it'd be better for the Bureau and better for me by plenty if we brought you in dead. And all the secrets and all the embarrassment you can cause the Bureau dead with you. 
And I can't help but admire how you hold yourself with all that staring you in the face. Terry Maddox staying in this dream world. But then I gotta learn. It comes a point, it's only pathetic. Because once these horses cross the finish line, the dream is over. Now, twice I've denied these guys who are more than willing to take you out. But believe me, brother, once they cross the finish line, you are coming with me, willing or unwilling, living or dead. Hey, from top. You hit it good? I sure did. Yeah. I hit it big. It's big. There you go. You are the man. Tell them to keep their distance. This list, all these names. Preacher says Stark's the guy. It's Stark. Clients front for. You figure Preacher's trustworthy. Yeah, I figure he is. So the people on this list, Stark gets them to say they use Klein's apartment. The fact that he lives three flights up gets reduced to coincidence. Yeah, but not to us. We're on Stark, via Klein. But still, we better do a nicest check on all these rich humps. I'm gonna go up to operations. Might as well run through bureau indices, too. But Klein's the key. Mike. Do you need glasses? No. Why? Glad we're back on this, Mike. No. My sister passing, you know. Otherwise, I'd go over it and over it. If I could have gotten her to eat, she could use the blender. How do you want to go after Klein, Mike? Jewish fella. Never go wrong with health concerns. Let me go up to operations. Yeah, go ahead, Vince. Where'd you get that? What? Where'd it come from? It's mine. I've never seen it before. Uh, well, I left it in this cupboard two months ago. I use it whenever I work in this building. Is there an OSHA violation here? Should I be wearing safety goggles or heavy rubber gloves? No, no. I, I just didn't know there was a blender here. It's a good idea, though, those health drinks. You know, a person can actually live on those. Yeah, well, don't you think the GAO designs the cafeteria food in order to reduce entitlement costs by shortening our lives? I wouldn't be vaguely surprised. Brought my own coffee. You, Ben. And, uh, maybe I'll bring my own blender from home. Dieter Stiles. Mike Mooney, NYPD, temporarily loaned to the Bureau. How you doing? I'm a U.S. attorney. Well, I guess somebody's got to be, huh? Anyway, uh, you're free to use my blender. Just keep it clean. Uh, what? There's a button in the, the blouse. I don't know. Maybe you wear them like that. I know, it's not my place. Excuse me. You might see me do that with the blender, though. See you later. Well, where are you, Howard? That would require taking the elevator, best I understand it. Well, you're right outside the door now. Use your pass. They'll buzz you in. All right. Howard Klein outside to see us. Is he? Agitated, Howard. Evidently upset over a call I made them to thank him for that list. Go figure. Yeah, I'm only hoping he's feeling well. Howard! Yes, Howard, come in. 
you remember it, Detective Trout. Yes, how are you? How's it going, Mr. Klein? It's gone better, I can tell you that much. Can I get you a beverage of some kind? Do you have chamomile tea? Would you wrestle up some chamomile, Benson? If not, would you like plain water? Fine. Nothing with caffeine. Sit down, Mr. Klein. Sit down. If I could only get off coffee. Are we done? In what aspect? Are we done? Are we finished now? I've had my lawyer provide the names. I'm sorry, Howard. We're uh, not prepared to close the investigation. Can you at least finish my aspect of it? What is this agitation? I need to be finished with this crap. I cannot go on like this. Can I tell you something, my friend? You do not look well. I'm growing a beard. It's not the beard, Howard. It's your color. Are you not feeling well? No, I'm not. This happens. I wish I could tell you it didn't happen. I feel like hell. I have recurrent angina. Howard, are you familiar with the expression taking it to heart? Of course. So often, my line of work, someone jammed up, or suffering legal difficulties, literally take their situation to heart and may fall over dead on their face. Oh, my God. Not a bad guy, Howard. Bad guys do wrong. They go out and play badminton. But good people, who for whatever reason, find themselves put in the middle. And because it's not their natures or they're not built for that ongoing pressures, these are the ones keel over dead. Water. Thank you. Overwrought, Mr. Klein. Join us, Vincent. What's the matter? I am not built for this. Have you ever read the book? Is it worth dying for? Not that I recall. Written by a cardiologist. You could be quoting from it. Is there a chapter in there, Howard? I thought I was pressed up against the wall until I suddenly realized it's a doorway I could turn around, walk through, and get out of my jam. What are you trying to say? I'm talking about, Howard. The last few years, you're making $50,000, $100,000 a year. Those people pay you to be on the board of directors, those companies you get your name on. And all you got to do for the money is to put your name on a lease on an apartment. In the middle of the night, sometime last month, someone called, said there'd be a million dollars in your name, bank account, Switzerland, whatever. All you had to do was say you were banging some girl you never laid eyes on in an apartment you never set foot in, and that you came in the morning and found her dead. When that call came, and you started thinking about that million bucks, you said to yourself, all the problems I got are solved. But you found out since, that instead of solving those problems, it was just the start of them. This is Mike Mooney, Howard, non-cardiologist, telling you that you got the right to reconsider. <laughs> I don't want to die for this. Are you finished with that water, Mr. Klein? Do you want another cup? My God, you don't understand. I don't want to die over this. You don't have to. The wall is a door if you turn and walk through it. I've heard Mike say that so many times. I'm not saying no. That's a start. It's not a bad thing not saying no. Well, I'm not. You've given me enormous food for thought. I'm going to say one other thing to you, Howard. And this is something you're not so likely to read in a book as to hear on the street. There's nothing to it but to do it. There's nothing to it but to do it. Am I with that one? I'm not, but I absolutely understand the logic. And I'm not saying no. Thanks for stopping by, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Detective. Thank you. And you too, Detective. Thank you. Ah, oh, I was just a water boy. God bless you. God bless you, Howard. God bless the both of you. I ever do wrong, and you're on the case, I'm just gonna hold my wrists out and wait for the bracelets. You ever do wrong and I'm on a case, you get a bus ticket, two-day head start. I've got some background for you on your date. Joanna Louise Kellogg, 41, graduated bachelor, 82, masters, art history from Barnard, divorced, receives no alimony, lives off a trust, philanthropically active, Kids' charities, adult literacy programs. 
No history of mental illness or prescription drug use. Admitted once to a hospital in October 96 for an upper respiratory infection. I'll make a note to find out what antibiotic she was treated with. Passenger in a car that hit a bicyclist in Central Park. Operator was Catherine Ryder, Lawrence Stark's fiance. How did that end up? Stark's fiance pleaded to reckless endangerment when there was a civil settlement with a cyclist. Well, you haven't really given me anything, Teddy, I can specifically use to manipulate this woman. It's not like you sought her out, Will. I did not seek her out. On the other hand, until she told me the other night at that charity function she pals around with Stark's fiance, I really wasn't thinking about fixing that pin on her dress. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Jimmy. Last I saw you was heading off to your semi-annual weekly case conference with U.S. Attorney Stiles. Oh, well, U.S. Attorney Stiles and I had a meeting of the minds. Subsequent to that, I picked up Terry Maddock at the famous Aqueduct Racetrack and installed him at the Metropolitan Correction Center. Good, Jimmy. How was your day, Agent Day? Oh, I had a nice lunch by the water with Inspector Cooper. <laughs> Dick. Did I uh, detect some personal tension between you and Miss Stiles? Remember the other night, Sarah, when I was telling you about a life filled with mistakes? Were we both up on ladders? Uh, I think we'd just come down. U.S. Attorney Stiles was one of your mistakes? Only if you count lying, misleading, and using her. There it goes, Bob. Oh, come in, Detective. It's not important. Please, come in. I'm just changing for a, for a dinner engagement. I see. That was work. This Howard Klein's about ready to tip over, so that would be productive. Good. As far as our confidential informant goes, we've begun to rein him in, so uh, that's productive also. You said uh, personal experience. Excuse me? As far as work. Uh, loading myself up on work. Your advice you gave me. I lost my wife and son seven years ago. I'm sorry. That's terrible. I found after that being at work is a relief. Certainly, absolutely. My condolences. My son gave me this tie clasp. Did he? I, uh, I keep an Empire State Building I won two of with my sis at Coney Island. Any case, uh, thanks for reaching out. I wanted to come back. I wanted to clear this case. I want you to. I believe that. Uh, how's my tie? It's all right. It looks good. Enjoy your dinner engagement. Thank you. I, I promise also to be more social. I don't know if she means church socials. What the hell she's talking about? That uh, U.S. attorney seems like a nice person. Oh, she is. She's uh, she's very competent. Last week in Metro, that if I had any ideas, I could try them out on you. I tell you, if you were right, the promise still holds. I can come back later this spring if you need more time. You released me on well, my own recognizance from that warehouse thing. Was that because of Terry Maddock? Correct. So, uh, was me even getting busted for it in the first place because of Terry Maddock? Yes. So he phoned you, and he tipped you off about it? 
That's what I'm telling you, correct. So what is it? It's, uh, it's like some ongoing business with you two or something? So where do we go from here? I don't know. Somewhere. Did you like the play? It was very clever. Oh, you didn't like the play. I felt a bit manipulated. Well, in the interest of entertainment, manipulation seems innocent enough. Let's move on to manipulation that's not so innocent. All right. having to do with why I invited you here. Well, this is much more interesting than the play. Well, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm acting under instruction. Uh, instructions from whom? Kate Ryder. Lawrence Stark's fiance. Kate wants me to put you under the hot white light and get you to give up everything you know about Larry's darker side. Well. Her concern is the uh, girl who was so horribly murdered in Stark's building. Understand, Agent Preacher, Kate's not taking the moral high ground. But she does need to be in the know. She is terrified of being ambushed with any news from one of those tawdry tabloids. Uh, I can't illuminate her on that subject. I didn't think that you would. My real interest is in your opinion of me for accepting her commission. I, you're her friend. That's what a friend would do even at the risk of manipulating a possibly new friend? Well, it's, it's not manipulation if you admit to it. Mm. Your turn, Agent Preacher. What do you mean? Well, you became ever so much more attentive to me at the benefit once I disclosed my friendship with Kate. Isn't that about the time that you adjusted my... Yes. You see, I'm interested in you, and I don't think that mixed motives disqualify us from having some future friendship if we're willing to admit to them. Guilty. I'm interested in you, and I want to get Lawrence Stark. Then let's don't lie. Let's be accomplices. Because I bet he killed that girl, and I hate that son of a bitch, and I know he's terrible for Kate. Just tell me what it is you want me to find out. I'm your girl. And if you want to go to bed, I'm up for that, too. This whole thing just really excites me. Oh, well, uh, where to begin? Abby Rents wants to know if they should come and get the bed. No way is that going to happen. No way anything here goes. Except the perishables, of course. Some milk. A little bad. Stuff here. Here's no good.
You sent me a message earlier today via the other blender. I need another message now to confirm it. Could, could we get a little clarity on this, sis? I mean, are you sending me messages or not? Because if I stay uncertain, I'm liable to end up in a bed similar to the one Abby Rents wants back. But mine will be in Bellevue with restraints and very heavily sedated. She's a nice enough girl. I'm going nuts. I'm going nuts.